Good morning, everybody. We are gonna wait for a few minutes here until everyone makes it in from the waiting room. And there we go. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm gonna start us off today like I usually do, which is with some Zoom housekeeping tips. And I'm gonna start by asking that everybody stay muted during the Zoom today, unless you want to unmute yourself to ask a question, which you're welcome to do. And if you're wondering where your mute and unmute button is, you must be new here because we've been doing this for a little while, but in case you've forgotten, your Zoom toolbar is maybe at the bottom of your screen, depending on the device you're using. The chat button might even be flashing because I just put a message into the chat. And the toolbar is where you will find your mute and unmute buttons, as well as your start and stop video button. You're welcome to be on video or off today, whatever makes you feel the most comfortable. I did put a message into the chat, like I mentioned, that is the best way to ask us questions today or ask us to clarify anything that we've said during our Q&A today. And I'll start you right now by saying, we only have, I think, eight questions. Some of them are a little bit longer, but we, we've probably gonna have time to get to questions from the chat today. So if you have questions that you've thought about putting into the chat, uh, today would be a good day to do that because we will likely have time to get to them. If somehow, you know, our chat gets flooded with 20 questions and we don't get to you today, or if you think of a question before next week that you would like us to answer, please email it to info at condolaw.net by 4 p.m. on Monday afternoon. That's our cutoff time so that we have a little time on Tuesday to research the questions that we need to research the answers to. And then we will include that question in our Q&A for next week. Also, if you submit a question or you're just curious about what we talked about in a week where you missed the live Q&A, the message that I put into the chat also has a link to our YouTube channel where we post all of the videos from these Q&As with a topic list. And so if you ever are curious about something and you think, gosh, they've, they must have talked about this before, you can search for a specific subject matter in our individual YouTube channel. So you wouldn't be using the normal YouTube search bar. You would be using, there's a little search icon, a little magnifying glass icon within our channel itself. And you can search by topic there as well. As with anything, the search tool is only as good as your search terms. So if you search for something really common like assessments or reserves, you're going to get a lot of results. So if you try to refine your terms, you might get a smaller number of results that are more accurate for you. Uh, the reminder we give you every week, I'm gonna start with that or continue with that, which is that we are not here to give legal advice. We are here to give general legal information only, not legal advice. So sometimes we have to email you back and tell you that your questions are too specific for us to cover in the context of a Zoom Q&A. Often that is when you're asking for a specific answer for your particular community about how to interpret your documents or what you have to do in a specific situation. We do try whenever we can to generalize those questions enough that we can cover the topic broadly if we think that it's something that is helpful and applicable to more than just your community. But do keep that in mind when you're submitting your questions. And so also the flip side of that is if you have an owner or a board member who comes to you with a link to our Q&A or our blog or something I put up on LinkedIn or whatever, and they say, you have to do X, Y, Z, or you can't do this thing because of something Valerie or Ken or Katie said online, you can ignore them because none of that stuff is legal advice for your community. And I'll also just take this opportunity as I often do to remind you guys that if you don't have an association attorney because you've never needed one, now is a good time to go out and find one, establish an attorney-client relationship. There is no cost involved with doing that. And it's better to establish a relationship with an association attorney when you have the time to kind of vet them, maybe interview a couple of different options, find a firm that's the best fit for your community, rather than being under the gun to do that if you get sued or some other emergency requires you to do that really quickly at some point in the future. I'm going to move on to our next sort of weekly topic that we've been covering for a while, which is the CTA. We continue to get a lot of questions about the Corporate Transparency Act and how to comply with its reporting requirements. I do want to tell you that uh, it has been challenged nationally on a number of different fronts, but none of those efforts have thus far 
born fruit such that we can tell you guys to skip it. You don't have to comply this year. In other words, the deadline still applies. The last day to comply with the CTA's reporting requirements is December 31st of this year. The statute, I think, says you have to do it before January 1st, which I find to be confusing language. Get it done by December 31st. That's what you need to do. There was a hearing on a motion for a preliminary injunction against the CTA last week, I think actually two weeks ago almost now, and we do not yet have a ruling on that motion. If the motion is successful, it might be the case that the implementation date for the CTA, at least for community associations, will be delayed pending the outcome of that litigation, but we won't know that until we get the court ruling on that motion, and when we do, we will definitely update you guys. I think we've noted before that we know there are lots of uh, law firms and management companies and just third-party companies that are offering to file the BOI reports for you, beneficial ownership information reports for you. And one thing that I would like to caution everybody about is to carefully read anything you are asked to sign by any of those companies, law firms, management companies, third-party companies, when you are either asking them to file your report for you or opting out of their offer to file the report for you. Because we have seen efforts to uh, put communities in the position of having to opt out of having someone do their CTA report and sort of sneaking in terms to that opt out that you would sign that would modify, for example, the underlying management contract. So you wanna be really careful about anything that you sign to make sure that you're not just saying, yes, we want you to do this, or no, we don't want you to do this, but that you're not also accepting modified contract terms whichever, with whichever company uh, that might be with. So pay attention to, to the things that you sign. Washington State, failure to read a contract is not a defense to being held by its terms. So read everything before you sign it and make sure you understand it. And if you don't understand it, ask your association attorney to tell you if there's anything you should be concerned about in that document before you sign it. The good news is that we do think that boards can complete the BOI reports themselves. It's really not that difficult. I know that it's just, an, it's annoying. And I think it's the fear of the unknown that has everybody kind of freaking out about this. But we just, I just did our firm's uh, BOI filing last week. Actually, I think I just did it a couple of days ago. So I think I told you a few weeks ago that I had gotten my individual FinCEN number because I already had a login.gov account established. You do too if you have logged into your IRS account, if you've logged into your social security account, if you have a TSA pre-check account, if you have any number of those federal accounts established, you've already got the login needed where you would go to the website we told you guys about before and register for your own individual FinCEN ID number. So that process literally took me like two to three minutes. It took Ken a little longer because he had to reset his password, right? So that might be the case for you as well. I had to scan a copy of my passport, which the federal government issued. So I'm not giving them any information they don't already have. I uploaded it to the website and clicked a couple buttons and that was it. I had my FinCEN ID number, my individual number. And then once Ken got his, I went online and it took me five minutes to do the CTA, the entire report for the law firm. Now there's only two, two members in our law firm. You might have five board members or three board members or whatever. So your mileage might vary a little bit as far as the time is concerned, but it is not a complicated or diff difficult process. So I, I think you don't, this is not the kind of thing that you should or have to pay somebody else to do. I also think it's reasonable if you just don't want to be the one to deal with it and you find a reasonable cost option for a vendor that's willing to do it for you, I think that's fine too. I will mention that we provide, we prepared a memo about the CTA that we are sharing with our clients only. So it's not one of those public memos that we're making available to everybody. But if your community is a condominium law group client, you can email info at condolaw.net and ask for a copy of the CLG CTA memo. And it's a step-by-step -step, um, like two-page instruction manual about the CTA and how to comply. So I think it simplifies the process even further. Uh, beyond that, if you have additional CTA questions, then you can refer to our Q&A 
video from October 9th, where we went into this topic in greater detail. Although I feel like that was a lot of detail. So I think I recapped it pretty well. And uh, I think I'm going to leave it at that, Katie, unless you think I should add anything else about the CTA stuff. I, you know, I, I'm going to say there is a question that got sent to me in the chat. Who would file the BOI if the association is still under declarant control? Or would an association only file if the association has been turned over to the owners with the board of directors? Any association or company that has been incorporated with the Secretary of State has to file the BOI. And whoever would file it is whoever's in control of the association. So if the association has been incorporated at the state level, but is under declarant control, then the declarant would be the one filing the BOI. If, the, if, there are, if there's a five member board and two members are declarant appointed and three members are owner elected, then the board as a whole can decide who to delegate the responsibility for the association's BOI filing to, whether that might be a board member or a manager is you know, up to the board. But if there is an entity created at the secretary of state level, then there is an obligation to comply with the CTA. Valerie, I changed my mind. The yeah, only okay. thing I'll add is that it's every board member. And I just wanna reinforce that because I know like we have some boards that are pretty big. So even if you're, everyone's on the board, everyone needs to do it. So it might be worth scheduling a time to like sit down and everyone can create their BOI, bring your laptop, bring your iPad and have mm -hmm. like a meeting where everyone fills it out. And then that way it's the burden's not put on one person to gather everyone's information and do all that. Yeah. And again, as a reminder, the burden should be minimal if everybody goes out and gets their own individual FinCEN ID number, because then literally all you're giving the person who's filing the CTA report is, you know, your eight or 10 digit, whatever it is, FinCEN ID number. Uh, so that's a minimal amount of information gathering. Uh, we do also have clients that have talked to us about, like some, some of our board members don't use computers. How the heck are they supposed to get a FinCEN ID number? And my suggestion in that scenario was exactly what Katie suggested. Some call, put together a time that works for everybody to come to the same location or call into the same location. Somebody shows up with a laptop. The person who's willing to do that with their laptop assists each board member in procuring their own FinCEN ID number. And, uh, and then you go from there. And that, again, what that does is it eliminates the need to give copies of your personal ID and other identification information to the person filing the BOI report for the association. So before we, I think we're gonna be done on that topic for today. The last thing that I wanted to remind everybody about is it is now October 23rd. And if you want to increase your dues on January 1st of 2025, you have to hold a ratification meeting before the end of this year. So the statute requires that you give no less than 14 days notice and no more than 50 of a budget ratification meeting, which means that if you wanna hold a ratification meeting, say by early December, so you're not pushing too close to the holidays, you, need to get the notice of that budget ratification meeting out to your ownership by the middle of November in order to comply with the notice requirements. What happens if you don't do that before the end of this year is just that in January, you cannot enforce an increase in the dues. And if you hold your ratification meeting in January, then your increase will take effect in February. Do you wanna also then provide for some sort of like retroactive charge to make up for the missed increase in January? You know, that's a practical question that you can work out on your own. But just keep in mind that, and none of the people on this call who are managers need this reminder because you all are in, you guys are all hip deep in, in budgets right now. But for those that are not doing this every day as part of your job for your clients, do keep that timing in mind if you are looking to increase assessments on January 1st. So I think that's all of our sort of preliminary stuff and I'm gonna jump right into the questions. And again, if you have additional questions for us to answer, feel free to put those into the chat. <clears throat> the first topic or question that we have is this, what is the current recommendation on emotional support dogs in a no pets building? I am going to start by saying this, service animals and emotional support animals are not pets. 
Legally, they are not pets and they may not be treated or restricted or prohibited as such because they're not pets. So I think that's really like the pivotal issue here. So going into further detail, associations are required to comply with the Federal Fair Housing Act and under the FHA, associations are required to make reasonable accommodations to individuals with a disability so that they can have equal use and enjoyment of their property. That also means or extends to emotional support animals. Under the FHA and under sort of opinions interpreting the FHA, emotional support animals are treated effectively just like service dogs or service animals and must be uh, accommodated when doing so is reasonable. So this means that an association that bans pets, for example, is still required to allow owners to have service animals and emotional support animals, because again, service animals and emotional support animals are not pets. Legally, they are not pets. So you have to just make that distinction in your mind. The association can require that the owner or the occupant provide a note from a healthcare professional, not necessarily a doctor, which states that the owner has a disability and that the emotional support animal is required for that owner to have full enjoyment of their property. <clears throat> when I say property, I, this definitely includes their unit. It's less clear whether that includes every single part of the common elements within a community, but I certainly would not want to be the one defending an association client that prohibited a service animal or emotional support animal from, for example, being within the cabana, because that could then give rise to a claim of discrimination. The owner is not able to enjoy the use of the cabana to which they have the right you know, of enjoyment as an owner within the community or a resident within the community. And I think part of where I want to steer everybody is just a reminder that whenever possible, both because it's the right thing to do and also because you do not want to be the subject of a housing discrimination claim, you need to be very careful in how you handle requests for accommodation from owners, whether it's a service animal, an emotional support animal, a request for a wheelchair ramp, a request for a parking spot, any kind of request for a reasonable accommodation. I, I, I mean, I should have just said this at the very beginning. Service animals are not pets. If you get a request for reasonable accommodation, whatever that is, call your association attorney right away and get their advice on how best to respond. Because what seems logical or right to you may not actually be what the law requires or allows. And how you respond to a request for reasonable accommodation is really, it's crucial in terms of the likelihood of an eventual claim of discrimination and investigation related to such a claim. So all that being said, a couple of reminders. What the law requires is a reasonable accommodation. Not every request that is made by an owner is necessarily reasonable. So a great example that Katie put here is that if you live in a multifamily condo building and the owner wants to keep a full-sized horse as their emotional support animal, you probably could reject that request because where is the, where is the horse going to go in the condo unit, right? On the other hand, if you happen to be a condo building that bans all pets, but somebody requests a an emotional support, I don't know, pit bull, um, you can't refuse to allow that animal to be there because A, it's not a pet. You can't enforce a ban on pets. You can't enforce a breed restriction against that animal because again, it's not being kept as a pet. It's also worth noting that it is permissible to have reasonable rules around how animals can be, behave, how owners have to care for the common spaces, et cetera. So just because somebody has an emotional support pet or a, a service dog, doesn't mean that you can't, for example, require them to pick up their dog's waste if the animal poops in the common areas, okay? Uh, you can also prohibit animals from being off leash in the common areas. You can require owners to address noise issues. Let's say they have a dog that barks 24 seven, right? 
Making a reasonable accommodation does not mean that the owner gets to have their animal in the community without restriction and without regard to the impact on other owners. So it's always a balancing act. So as always, and you know, I know we say this in the beginning, but I'm going to say it again in this particular answer. Do not make decisions on issues like these based on what you hear in this Q&A. And do not pretty please make decisions on accommodations requests without consulting your association attorney. Um, the cost and the time and the emotional uh, effort required to respond to a discrimination complaint and investigation will far outweigh any minimal amount that you pay in attorney's fees to get the advice before you respond versus the cost if you respond the wrong way because you didn't check with your association attorney. Katie, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, the only thing I'll add is any request for an accommodation uh, for animals or not should be taken on a case by case basis. So basically you should not have one rule like, oh, we're, we're gonna allow all requests for accommodations or we're going to reject all requests. Everything needs to be taken and evaluated independently. So for example, with, with the pit bull, you may have a request for an accommodation. The dog happens to be a pit bull. Those are usually heavier dogs. Your declaration says weight limit of 30 pounds. Um, that is not enough to just reject the request for an accommodation. So it may be reasonable to make an accommodation to accept the weight restriction change that's different than like a full-size horse. So you need to evaluate, basically there's a difference between a heavy dog and a horse, and you need to make the judgment call of what is reasonable in that situation, not just a blanket decision across the board. Okay, next question is, does the Ukiowa requirement of 14 days advance notice of a budget ratification meeting also apply to non-Ukiowa HOAs for setting up a special meeting if the non-Ukiowa HOAs governing documents only require 10 days advance notice for setting up a special meeting, so not a budget ratification meeting? And does what's written in RCW 6434 332 supersede what's written in an association's bylaws regarding meetings. So the short answer is for the first part of the question about the budget ratification and versus the special meeting is yes. So I will say any budget ratification meeting for any community, whether you are a Ukiowa community or a non-Ukiowa community requires no less than 14 days notice and no more than 50 days notice. So that's for everyone because the budget ratification statute applies to everyone. For special meetings, also for basically all communities because this, the meeting statutes were amended, I think two years ago, for no less than 14 days notice, no more than 50 days notice, even for special meetings. That supersedes or trumps what is in your bylaws with like, a caveat that I'll get to in a second, but basically, generally, if your governing documents require anything less than 14 days, the statute prevails and you have to give at least 14 days. So if your governing documents say 10 days notice for a special meeting, you have to give 14 days. You can't, and then no more than 50. The only exception is if your documents require 30 days notice, which some do for a special meeting, you can comply with both the statute and your governing documents by giving 30 days notice. So you don't need to guess whether or not you can give the 14 days notice, just give the 30 because it fits with both the statute and your governing documents. That's the lowest risk option. Um, and I guess you could test and see if someone will challenge the 14 days notice, but pretty much across the board, minimum 14 days, you may be 30. Um, but no more than 50. Valerie, anything to add? No, I, I well, so the, yes, what I'll say is there is not yet case law interpreting whether if your documents require mo more notice, can you rely on the statute in giving less notice? In other words, the statute says the minimum amount of notice is 14 days. Your documents, let's say your documents require 20 days or 30 days notice. 
we don't yet have case law out there that says yes or no to the question of whether the statute trumps in the minimum notice, um, meaning when yours requires more, when your documents require more. So if you are willing to be a test case so that we could create law on that, you can certainly, I think, make a strong and reasonable argument that the statute you know, was amended. It applies to all communities in Washington state. It's clearly intended to allow for 14 to 50 days notice of any kind of meeting, including a special meeting. But if you don't want to be the test case, as Katie said, the lowest risk option would be to comply with a larger notice requirement that might exist in your documents, because that also still allows you to comply with the statute. All right, next question. I have a board of directors that is asking to be copied on all email interactions between me, the manager, and the homeowners. They are stating that the reason for this is so that they can have a record for future boards. Could you please provide some guidance on this? I'm gonna just say that ultimately, absent extenuating circumstances of which I'm not aware, and which wouldn't be appropriate for this level of specificity here in a Q&A, the board is the governing body for the association, and they are likely entitled to be copied on all communications with homeowners since all of those pertain to association business. A manager does not have authority outside of what authority is given to the manager by the board, which is the governing body for the association. As a manager, you are an agent for the association by way of the board. And so... <clears throat> You don't have authority independent of the board to say, no, I'm not going to copy you on, on, on my emails uh, with the homeowners, I don't think. Um, you know, can I, are there other factors that could affect the answer to this question? Sure. I mean, one of the things you could do is look to see what the management contract says, because that does govern the relationship between the association and the management company. Um, I also have practical concerns about this, and I think your board might really quickly get tired of being copied on every single email that you send with homeowners. The board may have no idea of the volume of emails that you send every day in managing the community. So I don't think it's unreasonable to include the board on all of those emails, but the board might eventually get tired of getting so many emails after a while. Um, the one thing I will also say is that it does maybe depend at least a little bit on what the intent is behind the ask. So if, for example, you had like a rogue board member that was asking to be copied and it wasn't a request from the board as a whole, I think an appropriate response there would be to put that request back to the board as a whole so that you know that the decision on that is coming from the board as a group, as opposed to an individual board member trying to exceed their, in, their authority. Um, and then, you know, separately from all of this, there is the question, which is still unsettled as to whether emails are considered an association record. And we don't have clear authority on that across the board yet, either by statute or in case law. Certainly, for example, if you look at the record statutes, they do not yet uh, contain a requirement, for example, that emails be kept for a certain period of time um, as, as, a, as a record of the association. So that is unclear at this time and until we get case law or statutory clarification of whether board member emails or manager emails or homeowner emails are an association record, you know, that's up in the air still. But um, again, absent extenuate, excuse me, extenuating circumstances or factors that we are not aware of, the board, if the board is asking to be copied on all emails between the manager and the homeowners, then I think the answer to that question is yes. They get to be copied on those. And then and then you can let them tell you when they're tired of getting those dozens and dozens and dozens of emails that you are sending with homeowners every day in your management of the community. Katie, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Nope, I think you covered it. So the next question is, the last Q&A mentioned that a director could be removed if they refuse to comply with the CTA's reporting requirements. Can you talk more about how to remove a director and what circumstances might be good cause for doing so. So first, we didn't say that the failure to comply with the CTA is grounds for the removal of a director. If your governing documents currently are silent on the matter. So basically you can amend your documents to make failure to comply with the CTA or 
other statutory requirements or whatever to be grounds for removal, but the statute does not, no statute does that now, and that is not a requirement. So we just want to correct that. Don't, for most communities, you cannot, the board cannot remove a board member for their failure to comply with the CTA on its own. Um, owners could choose to recall or remove a board member if the board member refuses to comply with the CTA. And that's because the owners only are the ones who get to make decisions on whether or not a board member should be removed or recalled. The board could strip a director of their officer position, but that's all they can do without a vote of the owners. And owners get to decide if they want to remove a board member for any reason or for no reason. Uh, that's the power that the owners have. And it might not seem fair to the board member being removed if it's for no reason because it's a personal issue, but that is why owners have a voice and a vote. So owners can vote to remove a board member by petitioning for a special meeting to do so. The special meeting can be called by the board president, the board as a whole, or for some communities um, by the owners if the board refuses or fails to call the meeting. So for Ukiowa communities uh, under 6490-445, if the board refuses to call a special meeting after 30 days of receiving the petition for a special meeting for the removal of an owner or a board member, the owners can call that meeting. You should look at your governing documents if you're a non-Ukiowa community to see if there is some similar language. Sometimes they have it. At the meeting, there is a vote to remove the board member. Usually, and for Ukiowa communities, the board member gets an opportunity to speak, and you should look at your statute and your bylaws for what happens after a board member is removed to see if there needs to be a vote held immediately or if the board can appoint it will be case specific and we can't get into it. The percent required for the board member to be removed will depend on your bylaws or for Ukiowa communities under 6490-520, a board member is removed if they receive a majority of the votes of the association or two thirds of the votes cast by unit owners at the meeting. So again, look at your documents, look at your statute if you're getting to a place where you actually want to remove a board member to see what vote is required. The last part of the question is what circumstances might be good cause for doing so. We can't give an exhaustive list. Like I said, board members can be removed for any reason or no reason, um, but some reasons that we have seen in the past is a board member failing to meet their duty of care, failing to comply with statutory requirements, as I've already discussed, failing to attend board meetings and et cetera. So it, it's really gonna be fact specific and you'll need support of the community anyway to do it. So Valerie, anything to add? Yeah, I will add that under the Condominium Act 6434-308 subsection eight, the percentage of owner votes required to remove a member of the board is two thirds of the voting power in the association present and entitled to vote at any meeting of the unit owners at which a quorum is present. So it's essentially the same outside of the whole majority of the votes in the association. It's a it's the same voting requirement under that you see under Wakaiwa. But again, I do wanna make it really clear, we did not say that failure to comply with the CTA is grounds for removal from the board. And the board itself cannot kick someone else off the board. You, you must have a vote of the owners in order to do that. Uh, next question. In general, can a current board ratify a completely different board's previous decision, for example, 10 years ago, different board members, et cetera, that is not documented anywhere? For example, if a board member wants to do something that the declaration does not allow, a current board member can say, a previous board of directors said I could do it. And then this new board of directors ratifies that previous board's verbal decision. Again, there's no written record of this previous verbal decision. Doesn't the new board of directors have to take a new vote on this matter? Our bylaws dictate that we follow Robert's rules of order. So I think 
in order to answer this question effectively, we would need to know a lot more information. And in part, what I would want to know is what's the decision that you are being asked to ratify? The current board can certainly ratify a decision made by a prior board if you want to, and if the prior board actually had the authority to make that decision. On the other hand, the board, past or present, cannot ratify a decision that it did not have the authority to make in the first place, right? So if the declaration prohibits the thing that you're that you're talking about, you don't have the authority to ratify that with very, very few exceptions, um, even if a prior board did do it. Um, I also think sometimes there is very little distinction between ratifying a previous decision and just making a new one now, right? Especially if you have nothing written down about the supposed decision that was made in the past. One of the things that you will hear Ken and I and other attorneys in our firm say ad nauseum is that if it if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. And uh, I, I mean, I see some of you nodding your heads because you've heard us say this before. So if you have no evidence of that prior board decision and you're being asked to uh, decide whether a certain thing can be allowed to continue or happen within your community, then I think it would be entirely reasonable and probably recommended that you approach this as a new decision and that you as a board ensure you are complying with your duty of care to the association and how you make that decision. So making a reasonable inquiry into the question at hand, relying on objective information, advice from third parties, qualified third parties, if you think it's necessary in that scenario. Um, and I think that you should review the decision consistent with that duty of care and that obligation to inquire and gather information, et cetera, rather than just blindly ratifying something that a previous board supposedly did, um, just because they did it doesn't mean it was the right thing to do, right? So I, again, this is a really long non-answer because there's just too much that we don't know and that we can't know and that is inappropriate for the sort of general nature of the way we talk about these questions in this Q&A. But a verbal decision by a board that was never recorded in the minutes also might not be a valid action of the board because actions of the board are supposed to be recorded in the minutes. So you kind of end, end up getting into this loop here, right? And so I think, I guess where I'm landing on this is that um, without knowing more about the situation, I think there's little difference between whether you want to call it a ratification or a new decision. And in either case, you should approach it like you would any other decision the board is being asked to make. In other words, meet your duty of care, do, make a reasonable inquiry, gather recommendations or advice from third party professionals if that is appropriate under the circumstances, rely on objective information when you're making your decision. And then for God's sake, document it in the board meeting minutes this time, so not no future board is put in the same position to sort of guess about what might've happened in the past. Katie, did you have anything you wanted to add to that one? No, I think you covered it. Okay. So the next question is, in general, how should condo associations handle concerns related to secondhand marijuana smoke slash odor? Are there protections for those who are prescribed marijuana versus those who smoke it for a reason other than medical? So first, any odor, smell, smoke should be treated the same. So treat any other, like as you would with cigarette smoke or any other nuisance smell, barbecue smoke, all of those fall into the smoke category. It doesn't matter what the source or the reason behind it is. And for all of those, it is unlikely that the association can prohibit any type of smoke in the unit, except I guess barbecues, but that's a different issue. But like cigarettes or marijuana from in the unit, but you can regulate all types of smoking in the common and limited common elements. If someone is complaining about secondhand smoke, from marijuana, from cigarettes, from whatever else people smoke, the board should conduct an independent investigation based on objective information, adequate inquiry to determine if there's an actual nuisance or if the complaining owner is unreasonable. We all have different sensitivities to smoke and some may be worse than others. And it's the board's job to determine if the complaining owner is being reasonable or not, or if there is actually a nuisance. 
just like any smell that travels from one unit to another, there may be ways to reduce the impact that it has on the complaining owner. So before just trying to prohibit smoking or the transfer of smells, which can be really hard, um, look at other ways to reduce the impact on the complaining owner. So an example is having the smoking owner, again, cigarette smoke, marijuana smoke, doesn't matter, turning on their exhaust fan when they smoke may help. If the complaining owner is the one running their exhaust fan, that may actually be making the problem worse because it's basically sucking the smoke further into the unit. So you want the smoking owner to run their exhaust fan. It seems counterintuitive. Um, other options include blocking electrical sockets uh, with plugs or seals in the party walls, uh, caulking or taping cracks or gaps in the wall. Air purifiers may help reduce the impact. Keeping windows closed. So this, again, the smoke doesn't come in. And let's see, I think there was something else. Oh, um, blocking gaps under the doors with a door sweep or a draft guard may all be reasonable ways to reduce the smoke impact on the complaining owner. And so that's kind of the first part of the question. That's how to handle complaints. Investigate it. See if there are other ways to reduce the smoke. The second part of the question is, are there protections for those who are prescribed marijuana versus those who smoke it recreationally? And we talked about reasonable accommodations earlier, but if someone has requested an exception to a no smoking rule in the common or limited common elements as a reasonable accommodation, the board should treat it and evaluate it the same as any other request for a reasonable accommodation. Again, I don't know if there's a reasonable accommodation for regular cigarettes, but there, the board should evaluate it, consult with your association attorney. You're needing, you need to balance the medical need or the disability with how it affects other owners. That doesn't mean owners get to do whatever they want because they are requesting an accommodation or they say they have a disability. You need to balance the needs of everyone who is in the community with that request. And it may be that the resident who needs marijuana can find another way to ingest it that is not smoke. I'm not a medical professional, but it see there are like edibles or other ways of ingesting marijuana that may get the same effect that don't require the smoke to transfer. And so that may be part of the discussion if there is, if that arises. Valerie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, my addition would just be that two things. If, if the person who is smoking pot is doing so for medical reasons, you can just ask them if they're willing to consider a different method of ingestion, right? Maybe they would be willing to consider edibles. Maybe they would be willing to consider a vape pen, which might have less of a smoky odor to, you know, in terms of impact on the neighbors. But the flip side of this is I, I want to, I want us to be really clear. Legally, there is no difference between marijuana smoke and cigarette smoke. Washington state has legalized marijuana. So an association cannot treat one differently than the other. You have to treat them exactly the same. And one of the realities in a condo association in particular, which is the kind of community that you're asking this question about, is communal living, you know, multifamily housing, living in the same building as other people, you're going to be annoyed sometimes. You're going to smell their food. You're going to hear them walking upstairs. You're going to uh, maybe smell their cigarette smoke if they're smoking on their balcony. And community. And so part of the board's obligation, I think, is to try, as Katie said, to determine whether the complaint is someone being overly sensitive who maybe shouldn't live in a condo association or other communal living you know, uh, situation versus somebody who's got a legitimate complaint because the uh, sort of the noise, uh, the smoke transfer, the smell transfer is unreasonable and excessive. So if you have this situation in one of your communities and your board is not sure how to handle it, tell them to consult with the association attorney. Because part of what we would do in this scenario is we would, there's a whole bunch of questions that we would ask to help the board determine whether they needed to take some sort of action 
or whether the complaint was unreasonable. So that's, an, you know, another piece of advice, which is just have them call their association attorney and ask. All right, next question. According to the Condominium Act and eventually Wakaiwa, what are the voting requirements for terminating a condominium? So for Wakaiwa communities, the statute you want to look at is RCW 6490-290. And for new act condominiums, it's 6434-268. Under both statutes, you need 80% of the owners in the community or 80% of the voting power to agree to terminate unless a larger amount is required by your declaration. I would say it is very common to see a larger amount required by the declaration. You can, sometimes it's 90%, sometimes it's 100%. So you need to not just look at your statute, but also your declaration to see what percentage of the voting power in the community has to be, has to support a decision to terminate the condominium in order to do so. I do think it is not just as simple as that. And we would be remiss if we did not tell you to check with your association attorney if this is a step that your community is considering. Because depending on whether there are still common elements or other areas of shared responsibility, termination may not actually be possible, even if the documents say that it is. I also think that it's important to have an understanding of what termination actually means. Termination just means that instead of each of you owning your separate parcel number and being a member of this association that administers the common elements, there, you turn multiple pieces of real estate into one single piece of real estate owned in common by all of the owners within the community. So you don't separate the units, even though they have separate legal descriptions before the termination, right? They would all become part of the same piece of real estate. There's no association. So you turn the property into like, I don't know, an apartment house where every owner is a joint owner of the entire building. And then you have to have an agreement for the association to sell the property, or you get to go to court to determine how the property is going to be sold and how to distribute the funds. And interestingly, the Condominium Act says that the di distribution of income from any sale like that is based on the fair market value of the units, not the percentage allocations or ownership interest within the declaration. So that further complicates things because Let's say you have condominium, uh, you know, allocations that are all between, you know, four and 6%, right? But if you have a five-story building, the corner units on the fifth story might have a fair market value that's, you know, 30 or 50% more than the bottom floor units in the middle of the building. And that is how the proceeds from any sale would be distributed is based on that fair market value. So you would have to have valuations done of each unit to at least get an approximate fair market value. So you could determine sort of the fair market value percentage of the overall 100% and then split up the proceeds of a sale that way. So all of that is just to say, it's a fairly complicated process. And the end result is just that you all are co-owners of this single piece of real estate. And then you have to then figure out how to sell it, who gets how much money, et cetera. Um, so I would not even start a conversation about this without consulting with your association attorney. Katie, did you have anything to add? No, you covered it. And so the last question we have submitted in advance is if the board learns that a delinquent, so really quick, the question we initially received was a lot more detailed and we have pared it down. So if this is your question, it's not going to be exactly what you submitted, but it gets the idea. So if the board learns that a delinquent owner has dementia, is there anything we can slash should do differently, especially if the owner is not checking their email or mail? We are worried that she could end up in foreclosure without realizing it. We are also concerned that she could be a victim of fraud or elder abuse. So first, if someone's not looking at their mail, and I guess this goes for anyone, whether they are elderly or not, if you think someone's not getting their mail or not checking their email, you can be a good neighbor and you can just go talk to them. You can check in and say, hey, how's it going, Sally? Like, let's, what's going on? Have you seen this notice? Whether it's because she's not paying her dues or because you haven't seen her at the last five 
community barbecues. Like, there's nothing in statute or your documents that prevents you from being neighborly. That being said, sometimes either you don't want to or it's not effective, or you've already tried that. Um, so you can also try talking to a family member if you see them coming over to the house, just to check in. You can ask her if they have a relative who you could contact. Sometimes the association has emergency contacts and the, the person may be unaware of the situation. Ultimately, and this will sound insensitive, it's not your responsibility if an owner ignores their mail but you can still be a concerned neighbor. So you can take steps if you're concerned about elder abuse or fraud or just their general well-being. You can call the police if you feel comfortable to conduct a wellness check or adult protective services or another social service who can assist with claims of elder abuse. abuse. Um, adult protective services may be able to step in and facilitate conversation or resolution if they're delinquent or prompt someone in the owner's family to step up and help the owner or appoint someone, whatever it may be. You could also contact a local church or place of worship that may have resources to help people like this uh, in this situation. And um, in the chat, we'll put some resources, but DHS has a couple websites that may be helpful in how to guide through the situation. Um, AARP also has additional information. So you can conduct research on the best way to contact someone to help facilitate with this owner so that everyone is not happy, but no one's being taken advantage of and the association is best served. It's we recommend looking for like .gov or AARP things. Ken did some research and apparently his first search yielded a lot of things that were trying to sell him things. So if you look for a .gov or AARP, you will probably have better luck. But again, ultimately the board's duty is to act in the best interest of the associ association. Sometimes that can be an opposition for what is the best for any individual owner. So if you are dealing with the scenario in your community right now, we recommend that you have an attorney review the homeowner's account so they can advise you about what to do about the delinquency while you are also accessing and assessing resources to help the owner on the neighborly and, and human level. Valerie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll just share that I uh, recently on one of the accounts that we're helping a client with had an APS, Adult Protective Services person, reach out to us when I think maybe the owner herself contacted APS and, uh, you know, his initial contact was not very friendly and assumed a whole lot of things on the part of the association based on what he had been told by the owner. And, uh, in our communication with him, we were able to, um, address a lot of the concerns and maybe inaccuracies that had been shared with him, but the ultimate end result of his involvement wasn't that APS took any action. He was actually able to get in touch with the owner's sister and the owner agreed to give her sister power of attorney to help her manage her finances better. And so sometimes the involvement of a third party agency, a social services group, isn't just what they specifically can do, but how they can leverage their involvement to bring in a family member or someone else that is a part of the owner's life to help them with some of these issues. So I think we have time to cover a couple questions from the chat. I'm gonna start with this one. <clears throat> a homeowner objects to the rule that no motions can be made from the floor at our annual association meeting. I sent him the references 6490, 445 and 455 and he came back with this interpretation. Assuming a quorum is present, an HOA homeowners meeting must have the provisions for motions to be raised by the participants, seconding discussion and voting. There is no apparent requirement for secret balloting. In-person meetings must have a provision for members to participate visually, sorry, virtually in the same manner as persons who are in attendance in person. So I think the question essentially is, can, it slash should the community allow motions to be made from the floor during an association meeting? Katie, did you want to run with this one? Somebody just rang my doorbell. Sorry, guys. Um, I will 
take a start, but so I will say for in terms of like what's going on with the statute, this is a hot button topic of whether or not it is allowed. Um, currently, the statute does say, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, um, whether or not you can take motions from the floor or if you're limited to what is being discussed in that meeting um, and what is sent in the meeting notice. It does depend on what the meeting is, but typically whoever is presiding over the meeting can make that decision. Um, and so Valerie, do you want to address the rest or talk yeah. about, okay, go ahead. The other thing, I think it also matters whether, for example, you are allowing absentee ba ballots. So there are very specific statutory requirements when it comes to how unit owners vote on certain issues. So if you govern, if you Google your governing statute, which the person who submitted the question gave citations from Wakaiowa, those provisions are only applicable to Wakaiowa communities right now. So those provisions may be wholly inapplicable to your community, depending on if you are a, a non-Wakaiowa community. But all of the governing statutes were amended in 2021, I think, to have uh, updated voting sections. So if you Google RCW 6434, which is the Condominium Act, and then the word voting, it'll take you straight to the section or link you to the section of the Condominium Act that walks you through voting options for your community. So in particular, the secret balloting issue that was mentioned in the question, that is only applicable like to Wakaiowa yeah. communities right now. None of the other statutes have secret voting requirements or, or um, provisions. So that part of Wakaiowa, all of Wakaiowa, will only be applicable to everybody else once we get to January 1st, 2028. The reason I brought up the absentee ballot issue is because if you are voting on certain issues via absentee ballot, then everything that you are going to vote on has to be on the ballot provided by the association before the vote takes place, which can make allowing motions from the floor a little bit tricky if you are sending out the ballots before the meeting. If on the other hand, you choose to send the ballots out after the meeting, then it might be perfectly reasonable to allow motions from the floor because you can include those motions on the absentee ballot you send out to the ownership after the meeting is over. So I don't think there's a one size fits all answer to this question. I think it depends on what statute you're governed by, what your particular documents say. And if you want advice on how to handle or respond to this owner in this particular situation, then you need to consult with your association attorney in order to get that advice. Um, Valerie, I'll just answer the follow-up question before the last one, which is to yeah. be a Ukiowa community, do you have to have adopted Ukiowa? Um, for communities formed before July 1st, 2018, you have to adopt Ukiowa to be a Ukiowa community. Any community formed after July 1st, 2018 is a Ukiowa community, and everyone will be a Ukiowa community January 1st, 2028. But if you have not adopted it and you your community was formed in like 1970, you are not a Ukiowa community yet. Agreed. All right. Uh, I think we have time to maybe very quickly cover one other question. If we have time, can we ask if an active leak into the building from the roof area can be considered an emergency to allow the board to immediately address this via email and start repairs, et cetera, versus waiting two weeks to hold an open meeting. We are under open board meeting rules. So I'm gonna start by saying this, this is not legal advice. You need to submit this question to your association attorney. However, if you are dealing with an active leak, always the right answer is gonna be fix the leak, stop the leak. You don't even, I don't think need a board meeting. That's it. Sorry, guys. Yes. Oh, always stop the leak. You don't need a board meeting, whether or not, because you're not doing any repairs. You are just stopping the leak. If that is throwing a blue tarp over the roof because it's water intrusion, stop the leak and then follow the process for whether or not you can call an emergency meeting or something can happen over email. Take the time to reevaluate once you've stopped the leak. Sorry about that. 
my dog has the best timing. The pest control guy is in the backyard. So all of that being said, I do want to remind everybody, and in particular, the person that submitted this question, that you cannot rely on this answer here for your how to handle this situation in your community. So ask your association attorney this question instead of relying on what we said here. And that brings us to 11 o'clock. So we are done for the day. Thank you again for joining us. And we hope to see you guys back here next week. Bye, everybody.